big round of applause for Director Jam Jam, producer Jeff Byrne. Joining us up here. Uh, how many seats we got? Uh, a lot. <laughs> Whitney. Yeah. <laughs> Whitney Moore. Whitney Chelsea. Is this thing on? Yeah. Whitney Chelsea. TJ, come on up. Get the full in. Yeah. Oh. Shout outs. Whitney Moore. Yeah. <laughs> Chelsea Turnbow. Thomas Favaloro. <laughs> and James Wynn. <laughs> and I'm the main guy to blame. Uh, we're we're in the space for James here at the end. Sorry, James. Dr. And Jeff. Uh, I'll take word. Oh, this is James pretty far from me, guys. Oh, wait, you could, but as everybody move down one, everybody move down one. And then switch, right and then circle, and then every once in a while we'll, the music will stop and everybody will go around again. <laughs> anyway. Woo! That's what you missed in the beginning. So, James. It's nice to see you again. Welcome back. I am very happy to be back here. And I appreciate all the fans here for the world premiere of Redemic 2 The Resurrection. Can I, can I just ask, what did you guys think? This has been a year and a half. Awesome! Woo! Yeah! You kind of had to Sorry, Adrian. It's been a long time coming, James. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, the struggles and how you came to make your sequel to Redemic? Uh, how does this movie get made? And I know you guys will have your own versions of the story, but I want to hear from James first. <laughs> yes, well, I, I got the idea way back in 2009. Even before the movie became it, a uh, hit. Because okay. I kind of like, I actually I thought you mentioned stumble, it. stumble into the Labrae Tar Pit and the, the Ancient Bird exhibit in the Labrae Tar Pit. So I said, wow, they got egos and vultures, just like in Birdemic uh, Shock and Terror. So what, what a nice way to do a sequel. <laughs> and I saw La Brea Tar Pit, and you saw the plot, you've seen the movie, so wow, and so I thought that the plot would be even better than the first one. So, but in terms of the fundraising part of it, uh, even though Birdemic Shock and Terror became a hit, you know, it made it to the front cover of the New York Times, it got world press, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, it took me two years to raise the money, and I did everything in the book in terms of how to raise a fund for a movie, uh, and, and it was kind of like, uh, very desperate, you know, and one day I got an email from uh, Mr. Jeff Ross here, the producer. Thank you. you know, and, uh, I thought he was joking, you know, and, uh, you know. So one, did I. One, yeah, one thing next door, I met him at the Hollywood Happy Ending, he cut me a check for $20,000 to write the script. Oh, Jesus. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the so the rest was history, you know, so it's, uh, because uh, first off, you really like the Happy Ending <laughs> Bar. Yes, I mean, that's my hangout place. Yes. Yes. I mean, I mean, it seemed very empty in the movie. Um, <laughs> because we, we only had like two, three hours, you know, and we basically, we, even though it was a budget, they won $10,000. We didn't have $10,000 for that particular scene, so we, I, because the owner knows me, the manager knows me, I, I eat there, I hang out there all the time, so basically they gave us a major discount. So we know where to find you. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and Cost extra. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Jeff, is there, is there, is there the story uh, you, from your Yeah, pretty much aligns with what happened. Uh, I didn't just write. I mean, James said, you know, I met with James. Just quickly, this is how it is. I, I was just a huge fan. I come from film production, but I didn't want to work on another picture that I didn't need to see. I absolutely needed to see what James had next. He pitched me the story. He said it was a thousand times better. He told me, he told me, the birds come back from the dead. And... He told me the next thing, and he said it's a thousand times better than that. That's when I took out the checkbook and wrote him a check for $20,000. And I said, and I can't believe you mentioned that number, but that's okay. It's James. <laughs> <laughs> to option the script, I ran around to every studio, Lionsgate. They all went, this sounds awesome. We'd love to do this. Uh, okay, so let me give you our notes. I said, nah, that's not how it's going to work with this. We have to do this 100% James way. It has to be 100% James, or this thing doesn't work at all. So I, they said, well, I can't really write a check for a couple hundred grand and, and, just, and just hope for the best. And I said, well, it was nice seeing you. And uh, I promised him I would make the film. 
I didn't know where the money was going to come from. I didn't know who was going to distribute it. Turns out it's going to be us. And, uh, you know, this was November. I optioned it end of November 2011. And uh, we were shooting by February. Uh, James, last time I spoke with you, you were very excited about gigantic jellyfish, uh, which I thought would be more prominent, but it seems to have, they, they seem to have shrunk in the story. What, what yeah, uh, it's, you know, I, I, I have a vision, and uh, the thing here is that this is the first time that I, I made a movie where I have a producer and a real crew. And, you know, and what's actually, that like? We, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, it's a uh, changing, it's uh, it's it's a little difficult because in the first one I was I was the I had total control and when you when you have a producer you do things in a very Hollywood way in a small way you, know, fast, you don't have to control everything and uh, and uh, it's, uh, you have to learn to adapt I mean you know it's a collaborative thing and uh, you have to delegate more and uh, and so to answer your question about the giant jumbo jellyfish if I had my Total control, it would have been more what you vision or I vision, but here this is. I didn't have total control. Jeff, what happened to the giant jellyfish? I'll tell you, I'll tell you, all right, all right. Me and James want to know. James, James wanted to, James had a, a, a vision. I gave him all the tools that he needed that we could really afford. The big set pieces was universal, you know, and, and La Brea tar pits. And uh, we, we, we shot the day, and James is a big fan of, you know, oh, we'll do it in post. And, uh, you know, we got the modeling for the jellyfish, and we did all sorts of things to sort of improve it, you know, in post-production. But, uh, you know, at some point you got to call it a day, and we did hazy, we did all these, uh, you know, after effects, and... And you know what, in the end, did you like the giant jumbo jellyfish yeah. scene? Yeah. That's, that's what matters. That's what matters. Well, yeah, as you, most, probably a lot of you here in, in, is on in the business, the movie business, and if you want realism in animation, as, you know, and, and you're talking about you know, uh, ILM or Stall, or that kind of, even that Jurassic Park, that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, and, and the... Uh, Texture and all that—that that, that costs, a, you know, teams of animator. You know, we don't have—we didn't have the budget for that, and so we have to work. For what I had, night Jeff and I—I I had a big fight with Jeff. You know, they said, "Well, you gotta, we gotta make a bird better. We gotta make us real." Jeff. And the reality in any day is that we just simply didn't have the money to make, uh, you know, as real as a hundred million dollar picture, even a twenty million dollar picture, even a one million dollar picture. James and, wanted you know, to make a, a, you know, one million dollar picture. Yeah, and, well, you know. And, and that just wasn't going to happen. I all that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in animation and texture, you know, and all that. Just that we just don't have the money to do it. I, I think James would have preferred ILM handle this, to tell you the truth. But, you know, we had limitations. We all were. There was but, a lot, lot to do. Yeah, but we made it onto the, uh, the jaw set, the Universal Studio <laughs> Black Rock, you know, and where the for, birds for, were for a movie as small as this. How did you guys do that? Oh, I think. Uh, I think they knew me. They knew me two years ago before I met Jeff. They, because I actually visit the uh, visit the girls, and they say, "Who's this guy?" You know, and, uh, and two years later, the same guy who managed the the, the rental in the, in the Universal. So, we oh, just took a tour oh. and jumped off the truck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, you know the big two, the two big set pieces, and I and I said to James, "Look, he originally wanted to shoot it in 3D." I said, "Look, this is a monster unto itself. This is a lot bigger than Birdemic One." You know, and we have to actually have to. Be efficient on the days and things like that. And James had his vision, and and so uh, uh, Universal. I credit Rory Walsh. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, you know, for really making that happen. I'll, I'll tell you something. I don't even think James knows this. We spent quite a bit of money, right? And then I get a I get a very apologetic email from Universal, saying, "Oh my God, we're so sorry. We never turned off the blowers." Would you like to come back and shoot another day, or would you like half your money back? I said, give me that fucking check. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what's so fun about shooting on the lot, you know? On the University of Back on the Jaw set, uh, you know, we're part of it where they shot, where, where Spielberg shot the, the, the Jaws, 
is a few feet away on the, on the left is where on the, there's a sound stage where Hitchcock uh, filmed the birth, the actual birth in 1962. Uh, and on so the right, a few feet away, there, there was there's a psycho set. Okay, so it was kind of like, it's exciting. You're shooting a movie on the thing, yet if you're right next to uh, uh, the master of suspense, Hitchcock himself. Uh, and uh, to me, that's that made it worthwhile uh, uh, to make Pandemic 2, despite uh, you know you see that some of the imperfection in terms of the visual effect, because we simply didn't have the money to get that you know that Hollywood. Don't animation. you know, James? Well, don't well, apologize. I think it's perfect. Yes. I mean, I think it's perfect. That was a great time. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, let's talk a little bit to all these fine actors we have over here. Woo! Uh, all right. I'm going to start with, with Lydia Allen, because uh, I've seen them before. Uh, you did one James Yen Birdemic movie, and you now you've done two. Um, how did this happen? Uh, tell us about what made you decide to come do it again? The money. Be honest. Oh. <laughs> Whip, be honest. Be honest. Just, just, and what was it like this time? How was it different? Alan had already signed. Uh, he, he was already a couple months in uh, when Jeff had come to me uh, with contract, and I was hesitant, to say the least. Um, I, I didn't ever imagine myself doing all of it again, because pandemic one took seven months, and I, I, was, I was really wondering why I would ever get into it again, but I actually had a couple people come to me and say, hey, are you gonna do a sequel? And Alan was in it, and Bobby was in it, and I had a lot of friends who were already just all the way signed up for it, and I thought I would be such an asshole if I didn't, if I didn't go for it, and I'm, I'm so glad I did. Thank you. Woo! Woo! You brought some serious moves on the dance floor. Yeah! yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like the first movie you were a little more uh, confused with the situation, but this time you're like, I'm in, 100%. I'm glad I got an another opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so how, how was it different this time? Oh, um, we actually had a crew. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to hold the boom between my legs or we didn't have to do anything. Um, it, was, it was a much smoother sailing than this time and last time, you know. Um, we had Jeff, of course, and we also had a crew, and um, we had yeah. food to eat, you know, it was awesome. We had things like call <laughs> sheets, you know, things, I don't know. Um, it was yeah, really it was... organized, but I like to tell people that I felt like the old grizzled war veteran because I had been through it all before, and now we just sort of got to have fun with it, and I think that that came across. We had a lot more fun with this one, and it was a more relaxed environment for sure in the second film, so we, I mean, I certainly had a good time shooting it, so. What about you guys? <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us a little about your first experience in a, in a James Jam movie. Uh, Tom, how'd you get involved? Well, well, I was actually, eat, I was actually eating lunch when I got the call from James, and uh, he actually told me that I was his fourth choice. <laughs> 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 gonna go ahead and go with me. Um, so that gave me a lot of confidence. I actually had never heard of Birdemic 1 whenever I signed my contract to uh, be on this What did movie. you think when you watched it? Uh, it was alright. Yeah. But I, I really did, I had a lot of fun working with Alan Whitney, Chelsea, James of course. Um, I mean, it was a roller coaster, a lot of ups, a few downs, but it was a hell of a time. He came down, he came down. I called him, I actually called you maybe first, I think. And then Jeff I brought you down. First, and he ran down to Long Beach where I was like that day. He was like, what do I got to do? What? And then I gave him the lowdown of what it may be like working with James. You know, because he had just come. How long were you in town for before you got this starring role? Two weeks? Yeah. So it's like, uh, it's, it's, it, it works very well. And then when I... I heard him read the lines and, and saw him, I was like, oh my god, we found him. <laughs> well, I'm really glad I got to be part of this, and you know, like I said, I appreciate James. James, how, how did you come to cast Tom? Well, he was initially uh, through uh, the uh, production manager, uh, the, uh, the casting, he, he, uh, there was a posting and a casting, and so he screened first. 
that he, he gave a list, both Jeff and I, lists of potential uh, uh, candidates. Mm -hmm. And so we, we actually picked a, a different person and uh, 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 he, uh, we told him that it was uh, because the photo casting was, was, was a fictitious movie like Argo. Okay, it was, it was uh, then we told him it was Remy and the guy flew, uh, flaked out. So, so that's how I, he became the fourth guy. You know? <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, so that's how I came to Tom. I like think he was the first to rise to the challenge. Yeah, see? And uh, so Tom, so I called Tom, Tom up, and I, I seen, I, I saw it through via video, uh, and I, I liked him. I spoke to him, and he seems like a nice guy, and he's got the right attitude. And uh, and but because Jeff and I under the contract, where we have to mutually agree in, in the lead cast, and uh, so Jeff agreed to, and I think Jeff met him. Yes. Uh, and so we decided to go with Tom, and it worked out. Uh, uh, say one little thing. James, close your ears. Okay, we sent James four, <laughs> we sent him four uh, videotapes and, and uh, you know, of the people that we thought would be good, but I was in love with Tom. I thought he was just perfect. This is before I met him. I sent the links to James of the audition videos and I basically said to Rory, my production manager, I just hope he picks Tom first. Uh, but Tom was fourth on his list, so when I called James, I said, well, you know, the first you guy... You didn't need to let us know it was out of four. <laughs> he let you know, right off the bat. Yeah. So, you know, I... I no, 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 no. We, we boiled it down to four that I, I could live with, but I said, this has got to be TJ, as I call him. Tom, it's got to be. And so he... Uh, I, you know, James put in order of, I said I'd contact him all in order, and he was number four on, out of four. And uh, I called, uh, you know, I called James, and I told him the first guy uh, passed on the movie. He, he's moving to, uh, you know, he's moving to Bolivia. Second guy is, uh, you know, uh, he, he moved out of the business. The third guy is completely unavailable. He's uh, he's, he's dead, actually, and so the fourth one is our guy, and, and James loved him, and he, and he came around. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Chelsea, can you talk, uh, James, first, we'll, we'll go, James, can you talk a little bit about casting Chelsea, and Chelsea, can you talk about what it was like to work in the movie? Sure, I, uh, I uh, discovered Chelsea uh, uh, through an agent. Uh, uh, you see the credit, opening credit, Ted Meir. Uh, so I knew Ted Meir... Uh, a long time, at least uh, seven, eight years, and his, his, his uh, and his talent is 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 casting hot, hot ladies. <laughs> I mean, if you, you if, if you any director out there think you want a hot lady, you gotta call Ted Meir. So you, so you don't have to go through all the casting process and things, you know. It's Ted, it's Ted Meir, you know, he's here. He's, I'll sell you his number. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And so he's, uh, he showed me a few pictures like that, uh, I mean, headshot thing, and so I came across uh, Chelsea, you know, and I say, wow, you know, uh, you know, well, first, it, to me, it's, it's all the first, it's the look, that she has the look, the beauty, the glamour, you know, and the second part, I think, is uh, can she act at any level? You know, so, so uh, I mean, you know, and so that's, that's my test. And, and the third thing, you know, like anything is, can I work with this actress? I mean, you know, it's an actor's director thing, and yeah, you, we got to get along it's a, you know, to finish the movie. Uh, and so that, that's how so I you guys got along? Yes, I think the most of the time. Yes. This shows Chelsea's commitment. It wasn't just that. I think the fifth thing was James. She had to be blonde. Now, she's a working model known as a brunette, and um, Chelsea, you know, really her commitment right off the bat was, I'll go blonde, I don't care, because we shot this on weekends to make everybody available not screw up with their schedule, except for Universal, it was cheaper on Friday, and then half price later, hey, <laughs> <laughs> who knew? Um, yeah. Chelsea, what, I'd like to hear from your point of view what it was like uh, being cast, and what was it like being in Pandemic 2? Um, the shirt. I think that it was a lot of fun, it was a great first big feature film experience. Um, I think that being blonde was, I'm naturally blonde, so for me it wasn't a big deal. But, um, I mean, that was very blonde. It was very blonde during the movie. Um, Grace Keller blonde. Yes. <laughs> but 
Had you seen Birdemic 1? Uh, I had not seen Birdemic 1. This worked in their favor, by the way, in my opinion. Uh, I, had you seen it before you began shooting? Um, I actually saw it for the first time here. When you guys oh. had that premiere a year ago. Oh, full circle. So, uh, when I came here, I was like, oh, this is going to be my movie, I'm excited. I saw the big line outside. I was very excited. I had no idea what I was going to do. <laughs> came in, and watching the movie with my friends. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different than what my agent explained to me. <laughs> of course, my agent's sitting next to me, just like having a ball of fun with this. But it, it ended up being amazing. Really fun. Was it was it challenging to uh, well, for for all the actors to be uh, to find a tone together? You know, like you want to play it straight. It's a movie that gets a lot of laughs. Like, are you playing it straight? Or are you deciding to, to sort of just have fun with it? I think I mean the whole direction was 100% be played straight at all times, be as serious as possible. But I think just us in general, we had a very hard time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, did to, we did our best to be as straight as possible and give it everything, but I think that we made ourselves laugh a little too much, maybe? I have a comment about that. Okay. It seems like we, we agreed at the very beginning to play it straight, no doubt, but in the filming process, yes, it was hard not to crack ourselves up. Watching the movie, it seems like we all exist in different movies. <laughs> No, seriously, that, that, was one of the, that was one of the things that, that, that I did say to the actors, just in general, is basically, especially anybody, any actor can wink at the camera, right? We, this was not going to be Gremlins 2, this was James' vision. Hey, Gremlins so give great. It is. Gremlins 2 is kind of a masterpiece, dude. This was Gremlins 2. This was totally Gremlins 2. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Gremlins 2, I mean in the self referential thing, in-joke thing. James, I don't know what an in-joke is, so this was a 100% sincere effort, and, uh, and I said to them, giving the director what, they, what you want, what he wants, his vision, shows good acting. Well, James, you, you, there was a, there was, I mean, it must have been the, the first year of Redemic and seeing the enthusiasm and the laughter people had for it, did you find yourself in any way trying to recapture some of what happened in the first film. I did notice the two films are remarkably similar in structure. Yeah. Well, yes, they're, they're both romantic thrillers. You see that uh, <laughs> even in the two, you see the, uh, in the first half of the Redemic two, you see the romance between uh, Bill and Gloria. Uh, Bill, the, uh, the auteur director, and it's based on Partially on me, but I see directors in Hollywood here. The, even the people who made who, who basically swept Sundance and did nothing after that, and even the huge auteur, well, he made one big movie. It was Hollywood big, but it was too auteur, and nobody would touch him after that. He would just continue on make auteur movie. You know, so it's, it, Bill is, is, by the way, named in honor of Billy Wilder, a great director. You know, but the character itself. The character itself is based on real life. Uh, talking about a director, a successful director, that, uh, uh, like that, and Gloria, the struggling actress, because I, I've done a lot of casting and I see the actress the struggling, and I see them disappear, and I see them, uh, you know, thousands every year to come to Hollywood to be the next great actress, and Angela Jolie, and you know, after six months a year they disappear, and uh, that one percent that survive. So I try, you see that I try to put a little story, just like in Birdemic 1, where it's a story about the Silicon Valley dream, and in Birdemic 2, you see the, the little story the, uh, about the small guy, the struggling director, the actor, the producer, try, try to make it in Hollywood, try to get that, that break, you know, that, uh, you know, that in the, the director, the pre-picture deal, you know, they only hired 50 to 20 director to direct Hundred million dollar picture. You really identified with this. Yes, I did. You know, so I tried to tell that. But surrounding on that, you see the the romance and foreboding, foreshadowing. Where uh, I just ask, I'm just asking you a question. You, you see the plot? Why I say it's better than the first one? You, you see why? Why did the bird attack Hollywood? Anyone here? Why did the birds attack Hollywood? Zombies. Yeah, yeah, but but what, what did you see? Okay, the, what did you see? You see the red rain? You see the red rain? 
it fall down Hollywood you see, on the La Brea chart. But the, well, the plot is that global warming has caused the, the ring, the color of the ring to turn red. And, we, and, and I got the idea from that movie Reanimator. Remember that movie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the global warming had caused the rain to, uh, to turn red, toxic, and then reanimate the dead. So when the rain falls on the great tar pit, it reanimate the ancient birds. So that's what the bird rise, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, rise on the great tar pit. And that's why when the red rain falls in the, on, on the cemetery, it, it, it reanimate the, the zombies. So, so that's the plot. One or two more questions before I turn to the audience and it gets too late. Um, since you're bringing up the, the cause of the bird's eruption, something I didn't ask you about or talk with you about during the first movie, but seeing the structure so similar in the second, I couldn't help but be reminded of certain thoughts on my mind. Is there something significant about the fact that as soon as uh, the, the couple gets together and finally has sex, reality destructs? <laughs> Like, I mean, it's like, they get together, and all of reality tears apart. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a structure. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's my structure, okay? It may not be a, a, a Hitchcockian romantic thriller structure, yeah. even though the structure is based on a Hitchcockian romantic uh, thriller structure. You, you've seen Vertigo, The Birds, The Catch a Thief, uh, even Rebecca. You know, there's romance, mystery, you know, in the, in the first... Uh, it's part of the movie, and halfway, the movie discloses itself. Okay, so in my way of doing it, it's just a structure. It's a genre, you know. And there's a pattern to it, and that's the way I chose to do it. But if you if you've seen Hitchcock Vertigo, there's Hitchcock broke the rule. Yeah, you know, that you remember. Remember when uh, when the Scotty took Judy back to the hotel. <coughs> And, and, and suddenly, half, even uh, suddenly he broke the rule of the of a romantic thriller. He, what? Uh, uh, Judy stopped writing the letter, <laughs> opening up, disclosed that she's Madeline. Okay, so he broke the rule. So it's, it's not always like that. Okay, but so I just followed the structure because I, it, it's because uh, I, I I never went to film school formally. I just self-taught, and if there was a school, I went to the Hitchcock School of Cinema. And so there's a structure, but because of the low budget. And circumstances, uh, it, uh, it, there's a lot of imperfection, you know, the, the, perhaps the acting, the, the visual effect. I'm talking about the first one. Okay, so I don't know if Jeff will get angry at me, okay, but the first one, okay? There were 167 uh, it, different visual it, it effects. Became a cult. It takes it became, a lot. Yes, it became a cult hit, the first one. Uh, but, uh, but I think that the, the movie bit, because of sincerity and because the, struct was, the structure is still there, the romantic thriller, the, the, first, the, the element of romance and the thrill, the suspense, and halfway through the movie, the movie disclosed itself, why the birds attack. You know? I agree that the, the, the structure of the first film yes. was a big part of the success, that, it, that that turning point was amazing. But other than the structure, yes. um, well, let's, let's, let's give, uh, we're, it's getting late, I want to make sure the audience gets a chance to ask a couple questions. Uh, I see somebody right over here. Yeah, I want to know what everybody's doing next. What is everybody doing next? Je what's, we'll start this way. Until I'm uh, what am I doing next? Sure. Oh, Jesus, I'm retired again. Okay. <laughs> I'm retiring. I, I'm working on a couple of things. Uh, perhaps if you guys like this and the word spreads, hashtag Burdemic 2, and we do this, I think B3D is in the cards. James has the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll be a tactical beat, uh, but then make 3D. And then um, I've done a couple other things, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> oh, goodness. So Tom and Chelsea? Um, well, starting on Tuesday, we start our world tour, head to San Diego, and uh, we'll be locking that up for April and May and see what goes from there. Yeah, we're traveling for two months, solid. Uh, I can't even remember. San Francisco, Portland, Eugene, Oregon, and then Seattle, it looks like. I just got an email, and uh, we premiere in New York, yeah, the Sunshine Landmark on the 10th, and then Long Island the 11th, and then the 12th, 13th, we're back in New York, and then Boston the day after tax day. I'm and then sure they're taking notes. It just keeps going. <laughs> I've memorized this. And then, oh yeah, and then London. 
London, Nottingham, France. We're taking this wow. everywhere. Yeah, worldwide. Worldwide. <laughs> James just keeps calling, did you get Rome? Did you get Rome? Chelsea. I want to see Rome. Or with me, or do you guys have... Who asked the question? Me. What size shirt are you? Very, very tight. I'm going to cut it off and make it a belly shirt. Very okay. Tight. Come to me afterwards. Okay. Scared for you, Winnie. Right. Anybody who has a question we like, I'm uh, throwing shirts at you. Nobody's seen these shirts yet. Here they are. Maybe this is motivation. Chelsea. 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 that I get to go on a tour with this movie. Yeah. I get to go to Europe for the first time of all of movies this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I just got cast as a lead in a feature called The Wilderness. Yeah. It's a I did kick a little ass, so I'm pretty excited. James. Well, I, uh, uh uh, pandemic 3, I look forward to do uh, Pandemic 3 3D. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it'll be in Vietnam, you know, and the, the title for now is uh, Pandemic 3 Sea Eagle. Okay, that's, that's for, for now, you know. So that's, that's my plan, but... James, don't give away too much. Beyond, 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 the, uh, beyond the Pandemic franchise, uh, that I, I'm, make, I'm, try, I'm, I'm uh, producing a movie, directing a movie uh, called The Seas Rising, uh, 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 it's much more dramatic. It's still romantic, but it's more dramatic side, and it takes place in Vietnam, and uh, that's that's I'm, I'm working on that right now. But the last thing I think is that I, I one thing I want to do really, and hopefully in 2014 and 15 is this thing called Birdemic the Musical. I know that the hanging of my family is going to be in it, you know, but it's not. It's going to be sing, sang more like a, like a, a group of band, you know, than a one person. And so that's one thing I want to do is just the musical, uh, the Birdemic. Birdemic, the musical. Cool. I'm sure all these things will happen. You know, uh, speaking of... No, no, no. And speaking of Birdemic 3, and he just gave you the... the, uh, the uh, Sea Eagles. James has a, has, a, has, a, has a tendency, and it's wonderful. He, he hears a story on the news, and he heard about the John Jumbo Jellyfish attack, right, James? Yeah. And you turn that as part of the story. So he hears things on the news and interprets it the way that he uh, interprets it. And so, you know, James was telling me about Pandemic 3 and what it would be and in a resort, whether it's Vietnam or uh, Vietnam. Um, <laughs> And he was telling you about, he read this article about how these, uh, these, these vultures attack from the ocean and all these, th these, these things happen. And these, Is that uh, actually an these, article, James? These eagles uh, from the sea, and in my opinion, I think he just uh, sort of maybe misheard that it was, you know, they were talking about seagulls. <laughs> there actually is uh, a, a, a eagles, birds that are, they call uh, sea eagle. So, so they actually okay, you know, okay. dive dive into the sea and, and, and catch fish. Eat, yeah, eat, live through the on the, you know they dive eat the fish and uh, you know pick them up you know the fish and so they they actually it's a real archaeological it's a real a real species. Uh, all right, so way in the back there, just because I know otherwise. Yeah, you made a big way. I lost them, <laughs> and they were they were not part of my contract this time. <laughs> but I didn't actually, know that would even exist. In. <laughs> yeah, I actually sort of regret it because now um, I see the benefit of having cutlets in my bra. So like, I, I wouldn't mind, you know. Oh, it's a boot thing. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I thought she looked great. I thought it was bird attraction. <laughs> Uh, all right, over uh, over here. James, did uh, you have to leave anything out of filming? Really, really wish you had kept in. James, is there anything you left out? You wanted in. Outtakes. 
Inverdemic 2? Inverdemic 2? Well, I, I, for this, I, I don't think that uh, 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 I would let, 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 leave out anything because uh, uh, we shot very fast and it was a limited budget. But I, I always want, do want to say one thing that I did honestly try to make the anim the visual effect better. I, I really tried, uh, and uh, it just to, to get the visual effect, uh, you know, like ILM or J Jurassic Park. You're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. <laughs> you know, the texture and all that. You know, I'm totally competent. I know visual effect more than more, just good as a lot of a director. You know, it just uh, you're talking about money. The bottom line is about money. You know, and we just didn't have it. A lot of people worked very, very hard. There were a lot of shots, and uh, I, I guess I'll have to take the blame for not delivering exactly what James wants, but uh, sometimes James just wants things that, um, you know, aren't even capable from ILM at this point. So, but I think the point, I think the, whole, the heart of it, the, the message and how it is and, and how James works, I, I don't necessarily think that you know, a drastic improvement, and we tried uh, on the visual effects, would have really affected the story. And that's what you're really here for, is the rhythm and his story and his beats, right? Yeah. So, I think he did a fantastic job. James, what, what, if you could have envisioned, what did you want the birds to do that you couldn't afford? Well, the first thing is it, 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 realism. Other than you know, realism, realism, okay? I mean, sure, when, when sure, you sure. watch Jurassic Park, that was even like five, ten years ago. It still looked real, even today. <laughs> that was like ten so years ago. They did it because uh, I'm originally from Silicon Valley. They did with Silicon Valley uh, uh, high-end server, okay? And that, that's old technology now. You know, but they, even now, ten years ago, it still looked real. And so uh, that's the first thing, you know. And I, I, I think that it just I think that the, the vision. Is there anything you wanted them to be able to do that you couldn't get? Well, the the motion, you know, the, the motion of the, the birds. Uh, I I think that uh, it could have been better, uh, and uh, but uh, probably yes, you know. And, and I, <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is that when uh, in, in Redemption Two, I, I really the first time I learned to adapt to work as a team, a crew. In, in a way, halfway in a sense, Hollywood, you know. It, it, and, it, and when you do that, you you, you have you, you have to delegate, and and you don't have total control. And a lot of time, you're you have to trust third party, and it, you 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 know I wrote notes, you know, all this full reel, and the, I see the final cut, I wrote my notes, and uh, so you so you playing a lot around with the dowies and steady cams. Yeah, so yeah. Brian like, no. loves that dolly. Yeah, yeah. The camera's fine. <laughs> Flying all over the place during those early Yeah, you know, and uh, just... Uh, Are you a fan of Scorsese? <laughs> well, it just, it's, it's really basic uh, filmmaking. It's just my style. I mean, uh, I think I learned... Part of my learned how to make a movie is, is from uh, Miss uh, Tippi Hedren. Uh, my first movie, Julian Jack, uh, which I, uh, she was in it. Miss Tippi Hedren, was, she was the last great Hitchcock one in the original Bird. And and the first movie there, I didn't... Because my inexperience in my first movie, I didn't... Do too much movement. The camera steady over the shoulder, no movement. And she pulled me over, Mr. Tippett, and she said, James, remember, this is a movie. Mo motion picture, moving picture. She pulled me over, she told me. And from that moment on, all the movement I make is always moving. Moving on the dolly, the shake cam, you know. So, yeah. and, and, I, I, and even though in, in the spirit, in the structure of a romantic thriller, I learned from Hitchcock, but in terms of practical things, you know, Miss Stevie Heffern taught me that. I think it's yeah. interesting that James also has a tendency, he, he, he has his own view and vision and how things should absolutely look. I remember I wasn't thrilled with the Pepsi machine. James solved that problem. He said, no problem. And Coke comes out. And uh, <laughs> it was very creative that way. But, uh, you know, I, I find it interesting, and I, I, I did everything in my power to give James everything he wanted. I just wanted to build him a much bigger bus, and uh, I think you drove it quite well. <laughs> Can you see what I'm doing there? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I find it fascinating that James occasionally, you know, in the action shots, he'll, he'll leave the camera as a master shot, but in the, in, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the faux city scene, He'll, he'll use the 
doll, you know, it looks like a Michael Bay movie. I find it very interesting that those are his choices, and I think that's what makes him fantastic. Uh, over here? Yeah, yeah, I think Okay, so there's a uh, bird apocalypse. What's your go-to weapon, everybody? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it, to me, in Redemption 2, is the umbrella. You saw, you, saw the, <laughs> they, you saw the sunset. Uh, you saw the sunset. the umbrella. Okay, and the first one was the coat hanger. The second one was the umbrella. <laughs> I got one. Um, I grabbed a hanger first off because actually birds do hate hangers. But <laughs> actually. The tripod that I grabbed in the cave, caveman scene seemed like a blunter, uh, you know, object to hit with, and that seemed more logical. So I would probably probably hit that. <laughs> well, I don't need to grab anything because I made it through this movie without one weapon in my hand the entire time. Well, you didn't All you really do is a fence or your feet. That really, can we just go off on a tangent really fast? Yes. It's that when my gun got taken away and we had to do karate chopping because there weren't enough prop guns. There weren't. So, <laughs> I, was last, I was last with people to get a gun and then it came to me and there were no more guns. But it so worked. Like, because you gotta talk into the microphone, it's actually yes. hard to Oh, hear sorry. There, so, it worked oh. because oh. we could <laughs> just karate chop. That's it. That's all. Uh. And that's the end of the story. The prop person coming down the line, giving everybody their props, and then they get to me and they're like, Oh no, we ran out. So you're just gonna punch birds and kick birds. And I'm like, no! Uh. So you I know, guess. actually, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was my fault. I was supposed to give them an umbrella. But because of the pressure shooting on the jaw set, I forgot to give them an umbrella, you know. So that, that's the reason they started karate chop, you know. So. <laughs> but it worked. I'm alive. I, I had to have a, a line added in that was give, give Alan your gun. Or give yeah. Rod your gun. Because he's... He's on the man. That's <laughs> You know, first time I sit with Alan and he says, he says, let me, the first time I meet Alan, he says, I'll do this movie. I want to do this movie. We got to ask you two things. Number one, I want to be more like Van Damme. I want to kick some ass. <laughs> I said, okay, let me talk to James and uh, let me see how he wants to do that. And I think he really does. Rod kicks ass in this one. And the second one was, um, can you get me an acting coach for this one? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> That's true. So what, what, were the, what, what were the weapons, guys? Because we have more questions. I want to hear what's here. I enjoyed the unlimited ammo handguns. <laughs> <laughs> Shitty to my answer. <laughs> I'm going to have to go with the hanger. You know, that's always his classic. Yeah, classic. <laughs> what about your... Does he have those swing? You, he really trained for this. Uh, Alan really trained for this. Woo -hoo! So uh, All right. White on house kicks and everything. Awesome. That's oh. natural. What are you talking about? Oh, over here. What do you, you got a question? Why they're all wearing green at the end? James, was there a reason why they were all wearing green at the end? Well, they, they all, uh, they actually were wearing green when, uh, when the bird, after they make love, the birds attack on the set. Okay, I, I personally make like that. It's, the, it's part of the theme of the green theme, uh, the pro environment of the movie. So I pur purposely did it like that. So it's, it, it, it's visually green. So in the sense they they uh, you know they, they meet the zookeeper, they meet they met the. Uh, uh, I I think uh, uh, you know other people who tell why the birds are attacking and we got to live a greener lifestyle. So why not you know make the costume greener and so I think and it, it worked. And, in, and, and, <laughs> and against green screen, it made our job really easy. Yeah. <laughs> that was a. Beautiful choice. So, uh, right. right here. Uh, why did the birds leave at the end? Uh, why did the birds leave? Because we're wearing green. Because they got the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Whitney, Whitney has a theory. Whitney has a theory. Yes. They finally got Will the screenwriter. They got Will the screenwriter. They killed the screenwriter. It's a lot to absorb here. James, why, why well, do you, as the art story? Yes. Well, it's uh, the, the the ending where you see the guy playing dead, so the screenwriter dead in the pool. It's kind of like homage to uh, Sunset Boulevard, uh, really wider. You know, the opening of Sunset Boulevard is like that. So, yeah, come on, I've been around Hollywood, so I've seen Sunset Boulevard. It's one of my favorite movies. 
So the end was like that, okay, but uh, they, the bird fly away because, uh, in a sense, just like the, the first one, uh, give man a, uh, a third chance. Not a second chance, but a third chance to clean up. Okay, so... Let's see if that happens. Yes, Can you all go home and, and live a greener lifestyle? <laughs> no emitting. No toilet uh, paper. Uh, <laughs> over there. Wait, just a couple, cut time for just a couple more questions. What happened with the, the adopted sock? God, <laughs> is, is, is that going to be, are you saving it for bird bag 3D? Well, it's uh, uh, Colton, I think he's here, right? Colton is here. Come on, come yeah, on. Yeah, Colton's off. Awesome. Come on up, Colton. <laughs> right. Here's a brief story about Colton. Jay, uh, we keep hearing about Colton in the script. Jeff, Jeff, we, let, let's let him answer the question. Oh, sure. <laughs> so you were saying? Well, uh, the question was directed towards James. Well, I, I just uh, thought because if you want to see how would the kid, you know, the orphan, how would the kid, that kid continue on to the, the, the sequel? So it's got to be, you know, Rod adopting the kid. So it's just a convenient way of bringing him uh, to the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the sequel. Uh, and Cohen was uh, was really a nice kid, you know, and, uh, his family and everything. And, and uh, they, uh, because in the first movie, I, I didn't have, he was shot with very little money and the family helping out, Cohen, his mother and his whole family. And they're really nice, honest people and they're, they weren't in it for the money, they're in it to really have fun and maybe help out Cohen's career a little. And, and it worked out and, and I, I wanted to help Cohen, you know, so I, I, I got to find a convenient way to bring him in, okay. And so, uh, but his girlfriend didn't make it to the sequel. Uh, I don't want to talk about it, but I just say that you know, and you, you gotta be easy. You wanna be in the movie business, you wanna make it to do uh, your next movie or even a sequel, you gotta be easy to work with. That's just reality in Hollywood, you know. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's just a basic rule, written, unwritten rule, you know, if you're easy to work with, you know, things will, will move on, you know. So, uh, and Colton was easy and. Uh, and Tony, you want to say something, Tony? How, how, how was it working on the uh, pandemic too? How'd you like it? It was short. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing, Hadrian. Hey, let me just tell you, just for a second. James, uh, you know, and I assume, I don't know if Colton's going to be in the picture or not. I, I never met him, never anything. And then James calls me one day and he says, okay, I talked to his mom and they're going to report to set tomorrow. I said, James, James, he's, he's, he's 14 years old. He, he can't just appear. You gotta get work permits, and we gotta get permits, and and, uh, and a studio teacher, and things like that. I called Jim, different for you, James. spoke to yeah. Jessica, his mom, and said, look, we got 24 hours to figure this out, and I really want Colton in the movie. He ended up in the picture. That was one of the last days we shot. He did a fantastic job, and I hope he has a much, much bigger role in B3D. Yeah! yeah. Oh uh, no, yeah, no, we, we're calling in order. I only have time for one or two more. Let's 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 be respectful. Of the uh, all right, right here. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for everyone. What's your favorite part of the movie? Yeah. Hey, this will be voluntary, by the way. Uh, no, favorite this, part of the movie. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anybody have a favorite part of the movie? James, you your favorite yeah. part. I think I have two really. One uh, one is the. Uh, I, I think I like the uh, the story of the struggling uh, people, you know, the director, the actors, the producer. I, I like I like the first 20, 30 minutes. It's kind of a little story, but a small guy in Hollywood trying to make it because I lived it, and but also the, the guy who made it and blew it. Okay, so so I try to put that. You saw that. You saw a little Hollywood in my own eye. Okay, uh, but the second part I think that's fated is the uh, I, I think the, uh, the the resurrection. The Lavray Tarpet. The plot. The plot why I made Pandemic 2 is the, the red rain falling down like the reanimator, you know, the movie. Yeah. It, it, it re resurrect the dead and, re and resurrect the ancient birds. And to me, that's just awesome, fantastic plot, you know. What he's got about? Dancing. Hands How about that David Carter song? Yeah. When he sent me that, yeah. I went, fuck yeah! Whitney, you had fun with that. Oh, I had lots of fun with it. It's weird because the first one, 
one, I, I mean, I've been to so many screenings of the first one that I didn't start having favorite parts until they were like really small moments, like the like very lingering scenes. And I, this is only the second time that I've seen this movie, so I feel like we're gonna go and see this movie a million bajillion times, and I'm probably gonna find some new favorites. <laughs> Favorite singing part of the performance in general. I just love the new song, but maybe the giant jumbo jellyfish. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See, James, it's good. People like it. <laughs> Anybody else have a memory? Yeah, come on, TJ. Yeah. You don't have to. Uh, the jaw set was my favorite part. part. Oh, come on! I thought you were talking about the sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't an awkward scene to shoot at all. Not at all. Uh, but as Joe said, it seemed like we were fighting for about six hours to get maybe 20 seconds of film. But uh, yeah, that was my favorite part for sure. You keep taking my fucking favorite scenes. <laughs> it's okay, you can repeat it. You just second it. You're like, band scene. Thing. Yeah, I must say the Jaws location, that was fun to shoot. Um, just the fighting scene and shooting the birds and my awesome kicks. It was a good scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to say the ambulance. Oh, <laughs> Well, on, on, on that note, guys, it's, it's running. I think we've run out of time. So why don't you guys give all these guys a big round of applause. Woo! Everybody, stand up and let's have a nice evening. I just want to thank you guys all for coming out. You know, it means a lot to me, so... Yeah! Woo! Thanks, guys.